Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. With these precious words, I welcome all of you for this Vesper service. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, loving Father, we have been afforded the privilege of coming into your presence and worshipping you online at the commencement of the Sabbath. We just thank you for the promise to be with us, for your word has said that when your people gather together, your presence will be with them. Father, bless all of us who have joined together and bless the program in store. Bless the speaker, Lord, as the message would be delivered. Let the speaker's lips be anointed by the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sabbath church family. Good to be home this week and be here with you all. Um, as, we, as a Christian, life 
sometimes is very difficult to understand. In fact, it is the misunderstanding of life why so many walk away from the faith. In the series we're going to do now, a big part of what we're trying to do is to help give an understanding that helps make this painful and difficult life at least, if not understandable, bearable. So we're going to deal with a very um, controversial, challenging subject uh, in our next series here. Um, But I do want to just thank our church for um, the way that we have rallied together around some of the recent things. Our church is under attack. Um, The devil does not like what happens at Three Angels Church. Um, does not like that we have preachers that preach present truth, that uh, we seek to worship God in spirit and in truth and not really just as a show. Um, and so for that reason, our families will come under attack. We will see sickness come into our families. We will see financial issues. Our marriages will be strained. Our children will um, sometimes rebel, sometimes um, cooperate, but the enemy is going to throw everything he has at us. We have only one real way to combat that, and that is to rest in the arms of Christ. It is to trust him more as life gets more difficult. It is to use the one offensive weapon we have in our arsenal, and that is the sword of the word of God. And so we preach based on that word, sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. For that reason, when we speak and preach, we will be challenged because there are a lot of folk who want to be dis- want us distracted by politics and partisanism and uh, cultural phenomenon. We must stay focused on God's word. The world is slipping away right before our eyes. The prophecies are beyond just being fulfilled. We are now seeing that some of the prophecies we look for are behind us. And yet so many who know this truth are still asleep. Our scripture reading, as was so wonderfully read by our young sister today, Isaiah 40 and verse 28, says this. Hast thou not known? Have you not heard? that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not faint. He does not get weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He does not faint, and he doesn't get tired. We will never fully understand him completely. Our sermon series that we start now is... Creation versus evolution. This is part one, and it's called Origin Stories. Origin Stories. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity now to study your word. Lord, we come before you today in seriousness and solemnity, Lord, knowing that the enemy is angry. But right now, we claim the blood of Jesus Christ. Right now, we bind Satan by the power of the Holy Ghost and by the blood that was shed on Calvary, and we cast him away from this church, he and his demons. And Lord, I don't just want him cast away from this church. Cast him out of our homes. Cast him away from our families. And Lord, as we go into your word today, let me not be the one speaking. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from you today. This is a serious subject matter that I am not competent to fully explain. So we're asking for an extra outpouring of your Holy Spirit that he might lead us into all truth. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen Amen. and amen. We're going to go to the beginning, the book of Genesis. And every time we do this, we'll look at a different day of creation. Um, And so we start at the very beginning. It is one of the, it, it the, it is the verse upon which the entire Bible in many ways, is based. If this verse is not true, how can you trust anything you read hereafter? 
And here is why this series is being preached, because the world has tried to convince us that God is not real, that we are the products of chance and accident, that in fact what we did is win a cosmic lottery that there is even life on earth. It is one of the greatest lies ever told, one of Satan's greatest deceptions, and demons empower those who support this doctrine, this false doctrine called evolution. And I've been, I have been publicly attacked because of my belief that God created the world. And one of the largest newspapers in the world, when I was holding a scientific position on the West Coast, they said I, Eric Wall should never hold a scientific position in the United States of America. And number one reason the edit, that editorial writer for the Los Angeles Times put was, he believes God created the world. That's how serious this issue is. In fact, when you look at last day prophecy and the fact that there is going to be a time of trouble, do not be mistaken. Although the Sabbath is where the linchpin is, it is the question as to whether or not God is the sovereign creator of the universe that is most in question and how he is worshipped is the question upon which they will persecute. So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 begins this way. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The Bible does not leave any room for confusion. Who created the heaven and the earth? God did. And anyone who speaks against it speaks against God. I'm going to show you. It goes deeper than just that. But let me show you what the rest of this day in creation says. We'll go to Genesis 1 and verse 2. The Bible says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Here we have the third part of the Godhead in the, in the creation story, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I will show you that all three aspects of the Godhead were at the creation. And when God stepped out, he stepped out onto nothing, a formless world is what is spoken of here, and from this all things were created. Uh, and, and, if to, and we'll talk about this as we go through the series. There is an importance in understanding from a scientific perspective the law of causality. You cannot get the universe without a cause. That cause must be greater than the universe. Evolution speaks contrary to the laws of physics. We'll talk later about the first and second laws of thermodynamics. If you understand them, and especially that second law, which talks about entropy, once you understand it, you realize the world is not evolving, it's devolving. It is not becoming more ordered, it is becoming more chaotic. And this, we know, is the result of sin entering the universe. Once you understand that, you understand you are on a, a, a ship that is sinking, that even if these people who now do this age and regenerative medicine were to figure out a way for you to live 100 or 200 or 300 years, you'd still be living in a world that cannot last forever. And if God did not create the first world, there's no hope for us that he will create the next one. Hence, this issue is a spiritual issue, and I'm going to show you that all of the great uh, proponents of, of, of false teaching line up behind evolution. Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And there was what? There was light. Now, I want you to get something. We'll talk more about it later on. But notice that light is created before the sun is. But don't miss this. Light is created before the sun is because God did not need the sun to generate light. Hence, all of the centuries of sun worship were always misguided. Satan always pointed people to worship the sun on the day of the sun because God is the originator of light. Verse 4, and God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day and the night 
and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. One of the challenges that they bring against the creation story is the idea that there's no way that in 24 hours these things could have been created, that in fact it would have had to have happened over millions of years. I want to submit to you as we go through the Bible, it was, the Bible does not teach any other time frame than six literal days. And once you understand that, you understand that God had to be the one who created. And it is why the evolution is pushed for billions and billions of years. But I will show you in a later talk that, in fact, statistically speaking, and based on what the, science, what the evolutionists say, even billions of years would not have been enough time for the universe to come together by chance. It is all a lie. And a great deception that, in fact, if you look at the words of the evolutionists themselves, including Charles Darwin, who we'll get more into today, you find that there are holes and missing pieces, often called missing links. God saw the light. He said it was good. Can you imagine at the end of the first day? There's no sun, no moon, no stars yet. Yet the world is divided, light and dark morning and evening, and God is standing there. And you've got to understand that what God was putting in place, at least the way I see it as a scientist, God was putting into place not just light, but he had to put into place all that light meant. Light is complicated. There are, it's a spectrum. It, is, it has healing powers. It, can, it, it, it is so much to light. And God created light because he knew light would be needed for man to exist. Look at what the Bible says about the creation. I'm going to go through some creation verses of Scripture before we get into the modern uh, discussion. Ne Nehemiah 9 and verse 6, just to show you what the Bible teaches on this thing. Nehemiah 9, 6 says, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven and the heaven of heavens. With all their host, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worships you. The Bible says he didn't just create earth and heaven. He created the heaven of heavens. Here is why now in, in modern pop culture, there is going to be more and more talk about a multiverse. They're going to begin to try and change the universe into something else. God created the universe. He created the heaven of heavens. God put it all into existence. And the hosts of heaven, the Bible says, worship him. Was it six days? Well, if, if, if it wasn't six days, God is lying in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. The Bible says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and he did what on the seventh day? He rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The Bible tells us that we keep the Sabbath not because it was given to the Jews or the Hebrews. We keep the Sabbath because God created the world. There's a great quote, Ellen White says, that if man had not ceased to keep the Sabbath, evolution would never have risen up. When I went to the Creation Research Institute, when it was in San Diego, California, I took the youth from our church down there, and I remember going in there, and every, every day of the week, they had all these beautiful murals on the wall, all these explanations of every day, and you go through day one through six, you get to day seven, there was nothing, the wall was blank, and the guy was ready to move on to the flood part of the museum. I said, hold on! Wait a minute. You have the seven-day blank, but I want to say at the Creation Research Institute Museum, I've got to tell you that the reason you have to have this museum is because even the people who run the museum don't realize the importance of this seventh day. This day was hallowed. It was set apart. There is no other day in the scripture that has such a designation. When people tell you, no, nah, it's just any day will do. Well, then you're, you're speaking against God. T.D. Jakes, when he was talking about the Sabbath, oh, well, I worship on the first day, and I worship on the second day. But God only hallowed the seventh day. And in Satan's effort to, 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 de to deconstruct God, which is really what the great controversy is about, to make his character what it is, or at least make, it, make people have that perception of God's character, one of the things he attacks is the Sabbath. But again, one of the reasons evolution exists is because not only is Satan trying to get rid of our belief in the seventh day through theological deception, he wants to get rid of days one through six through scientific deception. 
You see, if there weren't six literal days, how do you keep a seven-day Sabbath? I met somebody like that at one of our Adventist institutions. He's a scientist, PhD, and he said, "Listen, I, I, um, I, um, I believe, you know, I'm a seven-day Adventist, Sabbath, but I don't believe in a six literal day creation." He said, "I believe it happened over millions and millions of years." And I said to him, "Then how do you keep the Sabbath? Which million years do you pick?" It's foolishness. If you listen, let me say this: If you don't believe what we believe, then don't believe. You can move on to someone who believes with you. But what we believe, and I, I, I showed this to you, maybe I'll pull it up again, out of one of the quote-unquote Adventist magazines, I showed it here in before, the guy said he wants to change some of our beliefs. The first belief in one of our Adventist magazines, it ain't really an Adventist, he wants to change his, the belief in the creation. If you don't believe God created her, why are you even a Christian? What is the point? It is, the, it is really spiritual espionage. That's what it is. It is people working for Satan under the guise that they are among us. And this is one of the litmus tests. Because if you can't get, if you read your Bible and don't get that God created the world and the universe, you fail. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. So there's two books that begin in the beginning. The second book, besides Genesis, is the book, the Gospel of John. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word what? Was God. So here you get the Word. That Word there is the Word Logos. And here I want you to get the two aspects of Christ that are revealed in the creation story. One of them is, he is the Logos. He is the Word when it says, and God said, let there be light. You have to see somehow that audible transmission, Christ is completely entwined in it. Christ spoke the world into existence. And the Bible backs it up. Here it says, uh, the same was in the beginning with God. Look at verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Did you get that? So now we know the Holy Spirit was there. We know God the Father was at the creation. Now we have God the Son at the creation, and it was Christ. You see, Christ is God made audible. And I'm going to show you later on, he is God made tangible. Christ is that part of God that deals with his creation. And so can you imagine as they stood there and said, let us make man. How powerful it was as God began to, to create. Hebrews 4 and verse 3. I'm going to give you some of the verses and then we're going to go into some other stuff. Hebrews 4 and verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. You know what this is telling you? Well, one, if you read Hebrews 4, it speaks really to the Sabbath and that there, there remains a rest for the people of God and that there's a rest in Christ. Some people say, well, the rest in Christ erases the need for the Sabbath. Not true. But what I want to focus on here is this last part of this verse. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Here's why that's important. What the Bible is telling you is there is no evolution. When God created the world, he created it and he finished it. Hence, he rested. Man, beast, single-celled organism is not still evolving. Creation was finished in six days. The Bible is telling you a scientific fact, as we will see as we go through the series. Colossians 1, 12 through 14 uh, says this, giving thanks unto the Father, which, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now watch this. And whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of, his, of, of sins. So it sets you up. This is Jesus. It's through him that we have forgiveness of sins because he shed his blood on Calvary. But look at Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Some people stop here and say, well, Jesus was born. No, he wasn't. Keep, you have to keep reading. But I do want to highlight the, this other part. Who is the image of the invisible God? He's not just God made audible. He's God so we can see him. Christ is 
Christ lets us see God's character in motion and in action in this real world. When you read the Gospel of John and you read the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery or the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, when you read those stories, it is giving you a glimpse of the character of God. Why? Because how Jesus treats those sinners is how he wants to treat us. And in Christ's life, and this is why I went to people who want to ask me, I was, we were doing North Carolina camp meeting, I had the youth, it was wonderful. We had 260 youth um, every night. We had people come for, for baptism. It was an amazing um, Carolina conference experience. And then many of them came to me after, how do I study the Bible? Start with the book of John. You see, if you start with the book of John, in the beginning was the word. What happens is now once you understand who Christ is, you go back and read John and Matthew, Mark, Luke, you read the four gospels, then I say read Acts. But once you understand that and you go back and you read Genesis and the Lord comes and talks to Abraham, you understand who's talking to Abraham. You understand what I'm saying? As you, as you, when you do that and you see that there's a fourth person in the fiery furnace and Nebuchadnezzar says, and he looks like the son of God, you know who that person is. And now the Bible comes alive because the centerpiece of the Bible is Christ. In the beginning, God created. Who created? Christ was in him creating. Verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Look at this. Visible and invisible. Whether be, they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and what? And for him. Now, you got to get this. This is heavy science. You see, they said it isn't just that God created what you can see. He created what you cannot see. Now, there's two ways to look at that. Spiritually, you could say the spiritual realm that we can't see easily. He created that. But I would argue it also speaks to the microscopic world. Things that we only now are beginning to understand. The Bible sets it up to say, listen, when you look under an electron uh, microscope and you can see the, the dendrites and the nerve cells and you can see the mountains that are established and all of those pathways, my Bible sets it up. You can't see it with your naked eye, but God created it. So when you start to look at creation, you start to look at the science of genetics, which is one of the biggest puzzles for the evolutionist. Because as you all know, information does not come from nowhere. Think about that for a second. You, you, don't, you, you, know, you don't just walk outside and all of a sudden, you know, your car has intelligence. It takes, someone has to give intelligence. And the fact that we are so amazingly created, David says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. It speaks to the information necessary that could not evolve. No more than you could hand out paper uh, to, to, to a group of people a thousand years ago and say, listen, create an encyclopedia. They'd have to study and learn to write the encyclopedia. All things were created by him and for him. Verse 17, and he is before all things and by him all things consist. I'll talk more about this in another message, but let me introduce it here. God created us. Christ formed us. Breathe the breath of life in us so that we could love him. You see, why do we love him, the Bible says? Because he first loved us. So he created us out of love, but we are created because God is love. He wants our love. And this is why one of the things we talked about during the apologetic series, one of the things that God cannot do, God cannot force you to love him. And it is why there is chaos and pandemonium in the world. He cannot force you to love him. Um, but it, 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 he created us with this free will and ability to choose. You can reject him because he had to give you the ability to reject him in order for you to have the ability to truly and freely love him. And hence, all the suffering, all the pain in the world can really be summed in that statement. You want to know why? People say, well, if, uh, we talked about it. Lex Luthor, in, when, I, when we did that series, Lex Luthor in the movie, Batman versus Superman, he says, if God is holy, all-powerful, he cannot be all-good. If he's all-good, he cannot be all-powerful, right? Why? Because if he's really all-good, 
and he's, and he's all powerful, why would bad things happen? If he's really all good, then he can't be all powerful. And if he's all powerful, then he can't be all good because he's all powerful and lets bad things happen. Lex Luthor, quoting ancient Greek philosophers on for our children to see, basically says God cannot be who he says he is. But Lex Luthor does not understand the great controversy. I should say the writers of DC comic books don't understand the great controversy. Because the great controversy says God's character is on trial. Satan said God is not fair, that God is not tr uh, trustworthy, that God's law cannot be kept. So God gave uh, to, hu to humanity as well as the universe. He gave all intelligent beings the ability to choose to love him or reject him. So the attack on creation is really an attack on Christ. And ultimately then, an attack on his work of redemption. Satan wants you to stay in your sin. He does not want you to accept Christ as he is. He wants you to stay where you are. And so he rejects. He wants you to reject Christ because in doing so, you reject the only option you have for eternal salvation. Evolution strikes at the core of Christianity. Now, let's, 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 do, let's get into this a little bit. Darwin had a war on God. This is the Wall Street Journal, and it says here, did God die in 1859? David S. Reynolds reviews the book that changed America, How Darwin's Theory of Evolution Ignited a Nation by Randall Fuller. And so in this book, he basically, listen, Darwinian evolution changed America for good. America was, uh, in, in, in its DNA, very Christian, very religious. This book came out eventually, of course, as you all know, it was laws were passed that creationism couldn't be taught in American schools. And America has changed. Now, here's the truth. Let's, let's be honest. Has America changed for the better? I would argue in some ways America has gotten better, but in other ways, America has devolved. Now, so here it is. This is Darwin. And so um, one of the things that happened to Darwin is that and I, and as I was studying this, I was, I was looking, I was like, this must have really impacted him. When he was about 42 years old, his 10-year-old daughter, his oldest child, died from a chronic disease that she had picked up. Um, she initially had scarlet fever, and she had trouble with her stomach, is what you read. I'm not sure what actually killed her, but she dies. What many people don't know is that Darwin was once a Christian. In fact, he was studying for the ministry, to use the term loosely, and actually supported foreign missionaries. He had a lot of relatives, as I'll show you in one of the quotes, that did not believe in God, but it seems from what I was reading that his father did. And hence, Darwin, like many of us, when catastrophe hit our lives, Darwin said, I cannot, I mean, he didn't say it out loud, but this is what people say, I cannot serve a God who would allow this to happen. The theory of evolution disconnects you emotionally from what happens on earth and makes it so that life really doesn't mean much of anything. In fact, what it says is that it is natural selection, that this is how everything came into being. And so the, the, the folly of this, of course, is that it doesn't really explain evolution, natural selection, even though they tell you it does. I believe in this type of natural selection. This is very... Um, inside of the species. So yeah, if a giraffe didn't grow a neck long enough to reach the trees, it probably wouldn't survive. And the one that did would. But it's still a giraffe. Because his neck isn't longer doesn't make it a horse. And it definitely doesn't make it a lizard or a bird. And that's what evolution says. It says because of natural selection, the giraffe that has, you know, the horse that had the short neck became a giraffe. That's just simply not, and I've studied genetics, I went to medical school, there's nothing that would say that that happens. If it did, you'd still see it happening. And you don't. In fact, one of the things Darwin says in his own book is, eventually the fossil record will prove his theory, or support his theory, because you will find all of these missing links between the species. And guess what? I will talk about it more in another talk. They don't exist. And so they say, well, this is natural selection. So you see the mice running on the dirt. 
right? The dark mice look like the dirt, so the bird, this, this bird of prey can't swoop down and catch them. The other ones show up. This is, if you've ever studied, um, when I studied in public high school and public middle school, there's the, the forest outside of, I forget which town it was in the UK, and the, the, the soot from the factories rested on the white trees. And so all of a sudden, the moths went from being white moths, because when the white moths sat on the white trees, the birds couldn't see them to eat them. When the soot came and turned the trees black, the black moths survived because now they, they were the ones that were camouflaged. But that doesn't make the moth a bird. That's the fundamental problem with natural selection as the engine for um, a, a species changing evolution. It does not, it simply doesn't make sense. And here's how the Bible tells you as we go through the days of the week. It says, and God created the cattle, all of the cattle after its kind. There's a firewall. Don't miss this, church. There is a firewall between the species. They were created after their kind. And unless they could find proof of it, which they should be able to find, you can't believe the theory. And we'll talk more about that later. But that's one of the things. This is, this is his mechanism. So it also does not cr- solve some other problems. The fact is, for natural selection to take place, you would need genetic information. Right? So inside of that, as we know from genetics, inside of that short neck giraffe would have to be the genes for a long neck giraffe. But if it's evolving to get the long neck, where did the genes for it come from? And this is where you know you had to have an intelligent designer. Because someone had to program the genetics of the cells to be able to produce all of the things that natural selection can create. And the evolution has no answer for that. All right. And I tell you, it does not create new species, but differences inside of species. So here's a letter from Darwin, handwritten. Um, you can't read it here. I'll, I'll have it up later on. It's just one sentence. I'll, I'll, let me read it from this book. Uh, Darwin's letter is a reply to a young barrister named Francis McDermott, who wrote on November 23rd, 1880, with a very unusual request. He says, if I am, if I am to have pleasure in reading your books books like The Origin of Species, I must feel that at the end I shall not have lost my faith in the New Testament. My reason in writing to you, Darwin, therefore, is to ask you to give me a yes or no to the question, do you believe in the New Testament? McDermott continues by promising not to publicize Darwin's reply in the theological papers. This Christian man writes Darwin and says, hey, I need to know, before I read your books, am I going to lose my faith? And I need to know, do you believe in the New Testament? The next day, Darwin responded. He wasn't brusque, but he was to the point and left no doubt about his belief, stating, Dear sir, I am sorry to have to inform you that I do not believe in the Bible as a divine revelation, and therefore not in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, yours faithfully. That was Darwin's response to the question. Now, With this, Darwin really makes the statement that he's coming from an angle where God has been removed. Now, remember, this is a man who was once studying to be in the clergy, a man who understood the Bible. In fact, I believe part of his draw to many people is they can say he used to be a Christian. The same thing you can say about Karl Marx and many of the other socialists. They came out of Christianity. This Jesus covers in the parable of the wheat and tare. There are those that will be called Christians who are not actually Christian. Now, here's where it gets a little dicey. You can read the book for yourself and make your own opinion. But in the book, A Trip into the, Super, into the Supernatural by um, Roger Morneau, when he speaks about evolution and creation, as you, many have told you guys the story of Roger Morneau, read the book if you, if you can. He comes out of demon worship and becomes a Seventh-day Adventist, and he talks about what the demon priest taught him. And one of the things the demon priest told him was, and again, you read it and come up with your own conclusion, is that Darwin was chosen by Satan as a child to bring forth the theory of evolution. That's what he says in his book. You can read the book, make your own opinion. But here's what um, Darwin says. This is Charles Darwin, the autobiography of Charles Darwin, 1809, uh, 1882. I can hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true. For if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that the men who do not believe, and this would include my father, brother, and almost all of my friends, will be everlastingly punished. 
Now, there's a lot more to this. I wish I had time to, to hit some of the other paragraphs. Maybe as we go through, I'll, I'll hit more of it. Charles Darwin suffered great loss. And here he says his father. So when I said his father might have been a believer. I think his father must have changed his mind at some point as well. And Charles Darwin got hung up on a doctrine that sinks many believers. So there's a few things that are important. This is why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, because only Adventism, in my opinion, properly answers the questions, and I believe it's very biblical. The first one is, what happens when you die? You see, other religions give you all kinds of other answers. Many of them tell you go straight to heaven, straight to hell. Some of them say you're reincarnated. But the Bible actually says you sleep. No one's in hell burning right now. That's not what the Bible teaches. First one. The second one that really sinks a lot of people is this idea that you will burn in hell forever for something you did in 60 or 70 or 80 years. The idea of an eternally burning hell is something that many Christians love. They love the idea um, um, that, you know, and, and Judah just had this experience. They run up on you and say, if you don't repent, you're going to burn in hell forever. And to scare you into salvation. But remember what, why Christ created you. And this is why one of the great issues of the end time is character and understanding God's character. Because if you don't understand God's character and someone runs up on you and tells you, listen, either you repent or you burn forever, they don't understand God's character. God has no, he he says, I have no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. God is not hoping you be lost and waiting for you to mess up so he can burn you forever. That's not what the Bible teaches. But the arrogance of many who call themselves Christian is one that, listen, I'm going to win the argument, and when I do, I'm going to watch from heaven as you roast. What kind of heaven would that be? It is not biblical, and it speaks to a character that God does not have. The Bible tells me that the destruction of the wicked is God's strange act. Jesus standing over Jerusalem, and he talked about how he would have loved to have pulled him under his wing like a, like a chicken brings its, uh, 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 the, the baby chicks under its wings. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. God is not happy people are dying. He's weeping. In fact, the only way the devil can cause God pain now that the cross and the resurrection have happened, is that you or I be lost. It hurts him more than we would ever know. And here, Darwin was sullied by this false doctrine. And I want you to start to see how these doctrines begin to connect. Right? If you don't understand why God created you in the first place, to love you and to be loved by you, And if you don't understand that he's not going to have people burning in hell forever because he loves you too much to do something like that to you. you, And he loves you too much to put you in a heaven where you still smell the people burning. Once you understand that, you begin to understand God's character. And here's why that's important. And I'm always going to try and make this relevant to salvation as we go through the series. That's relevant to your salvation because what you need to know is that God is looking at every opportunity to save you. He's reaching out in love to connect with you. The same way he reached down and, and, and formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, as we'll talk about later, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The same way he, re, he went after them after they sinned and, and, and reached out to them in the garden when they were running from him. It's the same way he comes after us now to touch us and recreate us as he created Adam and to find us and cover us in his love. If you don't understand this stuff, You think you're in a battle that cannot be won. Let me tell you something. Jesus has already won. Education, page 129, says this. Inferences erroneously drawn from facts observed in nature have, however, led to supposed conflict between science and revelation. And in the effort to restore harmony, interpretations of Scripture have been adopted that undermine and destroy the force of the Word of God. Geology has been thought to contradict the literal interpretation of the mosaic record of of the creation. There are those who now are trying to bend the scripture and say, yeah, yeah, those days were really millions of years. Or, Or some say, well, evolution is the mechanism by which God created. If he loved you so much, would he really sit around for millions of years and wait for you to develop? That'd be a long time to wait. Millions of years, it is exclaimed. 
were required for the evolution of the earth from chaos. And in order to accommodate the Bible to this supposed revelation of science, the days of creation are assumed to have been vast, indefinite periods covering thousands or even millions of years. Such a conclusion is wholly uncalled for. The Bible record is in harmony with itself and with the teaching of nature. Of the first day employed in the work of creation is given the record, the evening and the morning were the first day, Genesis 1.5. And the same in substance is said of each of the first six days of the creation week. Each of these periods, inspiration declares to have been a day consisting of evening and morning, like every other day since that time. In fact, the Hebrew for that word day there is the Hebrew for the word that says 24 hours. In regard to the work of creation itself, the divine testimony is he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Psalms 33 verse 9. With him who could thus call into existence unnumbered worlds, how long a time would be required for the evolution of the earth from chaos in order to account for his works must we do violence to his word? I hope y'all are getting this. You see, if you can, if you, what the devil wants to do is shock your trust in the word of God. You see, if God is lying to you in Genesis chapter one, verses one, uh, chapters one and chapter two, if he's lying to you in the creation story, if the first two chapters of the Bible are all a lie, how do you believe him in John chapter three and verse 16? When he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. But if he's lying in Genesis 1, how do I believe him in John 3 and verse 16? And so here's where it gets complicated. Because it is an all-out war against the creation story of Scripture. This is humani generis. This was from 1950, Pope Pius XII wrote and basically said that evolution is not, he didn't refute evolution, but he basically said, listen, you can, as a Catholic, you can choose which way you want to believe. With this, in 1950, 100 years almost, after Darwin releases um, his first book, here now comes this, 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 this um, encyclical that basically says, listen, evolution can be accepted. Open the door. Then the next thing, the Pope says evolution is more than a hypothesis. This is one of the strongest of all of the Popes, Pope John Paul II, um, very effective Pope. Um, if you've ever, if you were around when Pope John Paul II was around, he moved the Catholic Church in powerful directions. Uh, he basically said, listen, evolution is more than a hypothesis. And if you read his words, he says, basically, listen, what happened is, you know, um, you can't really refute the science. And the, if the science says it, then you got to believe the science. And I'm going to show you later on, that the Bible says, listen, this is, there's a such thing as science falsely so-called. And that's what we're wrestling against in many of these situations. Is the current, current Pope, Pope Francis, he says, when we read about creation in Genesis, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do everything. But that is not so. God is not a demiurge a demigod, or a magician, but the creator who gives being to all entities. Evolution in nature is not opposed to the notion of creation because evolution presupposes the creation of beings that evolved. I don't know how that even makes sense, what he just said, but I will say this. He's calling, saying God is not a magician. That's a powerful statement when you consider the spiritualism attached to this. And remember what we just read in the book of Psalm. He spoke and what happened? It stood fast. So one of the two are are at odds with each other. Either you believe what David writes in Psalms, that God spoke and it stood fast, or you have to believe what the Pope says, which is, eh, he didn't really just create things all at once. You pick who you follow. And hence, this is where the great controversy leads in the last days. Do you trust God at his word or not? Or will you trust man and his traditions over God's word? This is where evolution gets complicated. So here's where it gets interesting. So, of course, if you want to change the world to believe this, you've got to indoctrinate children. And I just did a whole thing at a camp meeting on how the media has so much effect, how when you watch something, how much imprint it has on the mind. Um, it is really overwhelming the science on this, you know, as you look at the health science. And so what do they do? Well, if you want the kids to believe the theory of evolution, you've got to make it part of popular culture. So you have movies like 
Mr. Link, and he's supposed to be like the missing Link guy. And I don't know where they get this brother from, but there's no skeletal fossil remains that support this idea. In fact, there's been more fraud. Sometimes they find like a jawbone, I'll talk more in detail, and two teeth and create this whole person that they say is some Neanderthal ancient form of human. And then they find out it's all a farce. We're going to talk more about that later on. Then they have, for kids again, Homer sapien. And they, you know, they do these teasings to try and get the kids to believe that this is how you've evolved, right? It seems like a joke, but it gets into the kids' heads. It gets more sophisticated as we get older. This is the planet of the apes, which goes all the way back to the 1960s. And of course, in the remodeled versions of the 2000s, they said, well, they took some drug. The apes took a drug for like Alzheimer's or something, and it made them smart. And at the, at the core of this is the idea that you evolved from an ape, from something non-human. And hence, as they make these movies, you believe more and more in it. And one of the biggest, strongest arguments is here. This is Marvel comic books, the X-Men. And the X-Men, there is an X gene that is, creates them, and they speak of being a new species that has evolved past Homo sapiens. And so your child watches this, hears them talking about evolution, hears them talking about these mutant genes, and, you, and your child is being subtly, consistently indoctrinated in the theory of evolution. I hope you guys get the weight of what's happening. Because then we get older and we're like, eh, I don't want nothing to do with God. And you say, well, what happened? Well, because we've been indoctrinated. And here's the thing. Charles Darwin was under the influence of a spirit that was contrary to Christ, an anti-Christ spirit. You see it from his own words, and there's a lot more I could, I could show. So ask yourself, what spirit is behind these shows? And if you deal with these spirits all week, will you really want to come to church and deal with the Holy Spirit? And so all of a sudden, you start, and, I, and I went through these, these phases. I went through phases when I was listening to X-Clan and Public Enemy and Bob Marley, and I couldn't stand going to church. But I realized later on, I was listening to stuff that was having me influenced by spirits that are dark spirits. I was listening to Bob Marley in his songs, Get Up, Stand Up, tell me that preacher man don't tell me heaven is under the earth. I know you don't know what life is really worth. And as they were breaking down Christianity, I'm sitting at home being indoctrinated by Rastafarianism. So when I come to church, I don't want to sit through church. And hence, you see these generations, we say, what happened to all these generations of young people? They have been better evangelized by Hollywood and the world than we did. The Spirit of Prophecy says in the book, in the, the youth's instructor, oops, missing an end there. It is Satan's studied effort to secure the youth in sin. For then he is sure of the man. The enemy of souls is filled with intense hatred against every endeavor to influence the youth in the right direction. He hates everything that will give correct views of God and of Christ. Did you get that? He hates that. His efforts are especially directed against those who are placed in a position favorable for receiving light from heaven. For he knows that any movement on their part to come into connection with God will give them power to resist his temptations. Who is this? This is all of us, me included, who grew up in the church. He works more against us than against the world. He fights us and our children more than he fights the world because we have been put in contact and in a position to hear from heaven. She says, as an angel of light, he comes to the youth with his specious devices and too often succeeds in winning them step by step from the path of duty. She says, we have here revealed to us the truth concerning the origin of man. She's speaking to the youth about evolution now. These words prove how false is the invention of Satan, which has been reiterated by man that the human race has been developed stage by stage from the lowest order of animals. This is one of the deceptions by which Satan seeks to lower in the eyes of man God's great work of creation. Here's the thing. If you really evolved from single-celled organisms and that single cell, you know, there's no real way to explain how it, you got life in the first place because one of the laws of physics and biology is you can't get life from non-life. You know, you just can't. But somehow it happened, they say. And you were a single-celled organism that somehow became a multi-celled organism. And at some point you grew flippers or, 
you know, scales, and I don't know. And from there, you kind of got to the edge of the water and grew feet and walked out onto the beach. And then you got off the beach and like, yeah, I want to climb a tree. It, it doesn't even really make sense if you just look at the world around you. But here's the problem. What are you worth if that's what you come from? Compared to the idea that a loving, infinite God created you. He has a purpose for you. He knows you by name. In fact, the Bible says the very hairs of your head are numbered. It's a lot easier to count some of y'all head than mine, maybe. But he knows. That's how intimately he knows you. And not only that, he didn't just create you. He's redeemed you. And he's coming back for you. Evolution has nothing on that. That's why they live this YOLO life. That's why this got so popular. You only live once, YOLO. Well, that's what, that is the creed and the mantra of a lost sinner. Because my Bible tells me I will not only live once. My Bible tells me that if I die in Christ Jesus, Jesus says, in fact, if you, if, if you die and you're in Christ, you have not actually died. It's just a power nap for the Christian. And one day when the trumpet of God sounds and the voice of the archangel is heard, I will rise. And there's a hope that I have as a Christian. When I go to Miami and I drive by the cemetery where my grandfather, grandmother, cousins, my mother, all of them are buried, I drive by knowing by God's grace, one day they'll come up out of those graves. Evolution has nothing. You die and that's it. So they say, YOLO, live crazy, smoke weed, drink alcohol, sleep around. And the misery that comes with that has now infested the world. Here's evolution's challenge. We're going to go through this. We're going to go through some of these things. One, the statistical uh, probability despite time. It's just statistically not possible. We'll talk about that in a future one. The failure to find missing links. Many of them are false. They deception. People made up stuff. The cases where they they glued on a, a lizard's tail onto a bird's thing and try to sell it off as it being real to because their big thing if you ever watch Jurassic Park we'll talk more about that later is this idea that the the birds the 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 dinosaurs evolved into birds complete total foolishness not a shred of evidence for it and many people believe it because it was in the movie I talked about the first and second laws of thermodynamics we'll talk more about that the entropy and the fact that if you follow the first and second laws of thermodynamics you can't evolution is impossible Billions of people are on Earth in just a few thousand years. So think about it. If man has really been around for 100,000 years or 50,000 years, depending on who you talk to, and we know that just a few hundred years ago, there were like 2 billion people in the world, and now you got 8 billion people, how did you keep the population down for so long? The, The truth of the matter is the population tells you man couldn't have been around but so long. There's a problem with the Big Bang. I'll show you a slide on that in a second. Genetic information needed for natural selection. Talked about that earlier. And one of the biggest challenges I have with, with evolution is that it literally was the seed of racism. Scientific evolution was the seed of racism. The idea, now what we know now, we've done the Human Genome Project. If you've never read the Human Genome Project, the whitest Northern European with the blondest hair and the bluest eyes and the darkest African, if you compare their genetics, the difference is infinitesimal. It's so little that you can literally find matches for kidneys if you need to do a transplant across these continents. Because ultimately, the Bible teaches we are one race. We all have one set of parents. That's what the Bible teaches. There's no real difference. All you see is so superficial. In fact, I was teaching, I teach at one of the nursing schools and I was teaching the class this week about skin and wound care and stuff. And I told him, I said, the number of melanocytes in white people and black people are actually exactly the same. The difference is how much melanin is produced. We're, we're not as different as we think. But evolution and then eugenics came in. And all these things came in, and this is a big part of how they justified a lot of the evils in the world. And here's what's deep. And then now, you know what they say? Oh, it was Christianity. That's what, that's what caused all of this. People forget it was Christianity. Protestant Christianity did that ended slavery. Only time in all of human history slavery has ever been officially ended. Go back and study it for yourself. Was in the United States and through the, 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 the British Empire. Now, the United States and the British Empire have a lot of dirt on their hands. Don't get me wrong. 
But at the end of the day, it was the Christians in those societies that rose up, people like William Wilberforce and the abolitionists in the United States, Christianity rose up and said, we will not have slaves. In fact, the British would send ships to stop other nations from getting slaves after they banned slavery. But nobody talks about that. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand the power of Christianity, true biblical Christianity. Atheism. In the beginning, there was nothing, and then it exploded. Creationism. Why is it so important to understand creationism? One, the existence of God. If you don't have, if, if there's no God, there's really no hope at all. It shows purpose of man. Without purpose, people get really lost, confused. In fact, they say the greatest threat, the reason so many young people today have so much anxiety and depression, why we're seeing youth suicides go up and youth addiction go up, is because young people today have no purpose. It's not stress, it's a lack of purpose. And without God and faith, what is your purpose? Speaks to the importance of the Sabbath. We talked about that earlier. Answers to the difficult questions of life, like why do terrible things happen? Without this, it's all just random. In fact, if really evolution is true, why not let the Nazis just rule the world if they're the strongest nation in the world? Number six is important. It is hope of life in the hereafter. Let me tell you something. That is a deep and resounding truth if you've ever lost someone you love. It is only in Christ that you have a hope for reunion. When I tell you, when I, I've told you the story of me losing my mother, I think about her often. Sometimes I dream, and I, you know, my mother's in my dreams and stuff. Now, you know, I don't believe she's in my dreams, but you know, I dream about my mother, just normal. And I miss her so much. And I'm so glad I have this hope. I'm so glad that although I have lost my mother, and although I have not seen her since 2005, that there's a day coming when I will throw my arms around my mother again. That's what the Bible gives us. And it's not some mythological wannabe truth. As we're going to show you, this is the truth of the universe. This is the reality of what we live in. And so the last verse is this in Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I want to submit to you today as they come and sing this song, especially if you're going through something right now. If you're going through difficult times, you're going through hard times, if you're stressed, I want you to know that the creation story gives us something else. It gives us hope. Beyond our daily trials, beyond our daily struggles, it gives us hope. Well, um, it was um, uh, the guy who the song is about, Horatio Spafford, lost his children when a boat sank in the Atlantic Ocean. His wife and children were going across the, the UK. He, they lived in Chicago. And after the, his, his wife was the only one saved, she got to the UK, telegraphed him back. He got on a boat and went across, and the captain stopped right where he had lost his daughters, right at the spot. And he did not give up on God. Instead, he went below the deck, and he wrote the song they're about to sing. And if you're going through something, don't give up on God. Go below the deck and write praises to God. Sing praises to him, and he will see you through. If you want it to be well with your soul and you want to accept what it is that Christ has done for us, not just in creation, but in redemption, I just want you to stand as we pray. Church Jesus is soon to return. The prophecies are being fulfilled all around us. And my challenge to you for this week is to go back and look at the character of who God really is the one who created the universe. Go back and look at the book of John. Read how he interacted with people and understand that he is a loving, patient God. But he does ask us to repent, to turn from our wicked ways, and to follow him. 
Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you for this opportunity to fellowship together. Lord, I just want to reiterate the words of that song, that it is well with my soul. Lord, it can only be well with our souls because we know you created us, that you love us, that you died for us, and you're coming again for us. So Lord, right now, you know who's grieving in our congregation. I'm asking in a special way, Lord, that you send the comfort of the Holy Spirit to them. You know who here, Lord, is dealing with sickness in their home. Send the healing powers of Christ, the bomb in Gilead. You know who here, Lord, is struggling financially. Lord, we, are, we claim the Bible promise that you will supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. You know where the marriages and relationships, children to parent, parent to child, you know where they're fissured and fractured. Father God, be he who is the Prince of Peace. Bring us together closer, Lord, despite our disagreements. As we leave this place today, Lord, let us never leave your presence. And help us to remember, Lord, this week you made us in your own image. You love us and you seek to be loved by us. And help us, Lord, to remember no matter what the world throws at us, we are valued by you. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen. And amen. You may be seated. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spreads the flowing seas abroad and builds lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command, and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed Where'er I turn my eye If I survey the ground I tread Or gaze upon the sky There's not a plant or flower below But makes thy glories known And clouds arise and tempests blow By order from thy throne Creatures that borrow life from thee are subject to thy care. There's not a place where we can flee, but God is present there. 